Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with and at the uh, University of Ottawa, and um, this is uh, my concluding uh, video for today. Um, I've done an extensive um, analysis and summary of some of the key points in Hansen et al., the land landmark paper that is out this week. So, basically, we're in the Anthropocene, the era in which humans have contributed to global climate change is usually um, assumed to have begun in the past few centuries since uh, 1750 when we, we rapidly started increasing um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from fossil fuel combustion and land use. But there are arguments that, um, like by Ruderman, for example, that suggest it began about 8,000 years ago uh, with uh, deforestation um, uh, affecting CO2 levels, or even perhaps 5,000 years ago when we started uh, doing a lot of rice uh, cultivation and so on, and methane levels started rising, or perhaps it was uh, started it started in the nuclear age when there uh, when radiation in large quantities would appear. So with the dropping of the uh, bombs in uh, 1945. Or perhaps one could argue that it, that, it, that it began in about the early 1960s, the plastic age, where plastic would start being Im embedded, uh, chunks of plastic in, in the uh, sediment records, etc. Um, so whatever it is, um, you know, the population growth of the planet pushing us to seven and a quarter billion people, combined with our technology and uh, our technological advances, have pushed us into a, an era of the Anthropocene. And now the argument and the analysis is showing that we can start talking about the hyper-Anthropocene um, phase, which is accelerated Anthropocene changes likely to proceed if we continue um, growing greenhouse gases, continue pumping high rates of energy into the ocean, leading to nonlinear um, sea ice, uh, nonlinear um, ice cap melt and sea level rise. Um, so, uh, continuing business as usual, humanity faces a near certainty, um, according to Hansen et al., and I've been saying this for a long time, of eventual sea level rise of at least emian proportions, plus five to plus nine meters above present day if we continue burning fossil fuels on a business as usual course. Um, so coastal cities and low-lying areas, uh, think of Bangladesh, the European lowlands, large portion, portions of the eastern United States coast, northeast China, many, many cities um, worldwide uh, will become non-functioning uh, cities. So. And this rapid sea level rise um, may begin sooner than generally assumed or recognized by uh, mainstream uh, scientists. The amplifying feedbacks, including the slowdown of the SMOC, southern meridional overturning circulation, and cooling of the near Antarctic uh, ocean surface, reducing ocean ventilation, causing the uh, the oceans uh, at the level of the, where, where the ice caps are, are sitting on bedrock, um, below, well below sea level rise, causing increased melting there. Um, leading, so this would be um, a very strong, southern ocean forcing feedbacks can be very strong, leading to very uh, rapid nonlinear uh, melting and nonlinear sea level rise, which will be impossible to avoid if we continue on the course that we're, we're heading. Um, the um, Greenland, um, there's a lot more prograde um, shorelines, and Hansen argues that it may not have rapid nonlinear disintegration um, for speeds for much longer, but I would argue that with the sea ice decline and the very rapid temperature amplification of the Arctic region, much greater than anywhere else on the planet, um, this will cause lots of rain on snow events and uh, lots of, um, it, it will greatly accelerate uh, the, the um, temperatures um, in the region and therefore, you know, I think those factors alone will cause huge, you know, enormous nonlinear 
uh, melting of, of Greenland, especially when we lose sea ice, there's no latent heat cooling of the Arctic region anymore, so the sensible heat um, levels take off and the temperatures skyrocket and we get very rapid nonlinear melting. But, you know, that's my view uh, in Greenland. And, uh, of course, the, uh, you know, as we get more and more melting, the models show that we get much stronger, more powerful winds and uh, perhaps uh, wave trains, long period, long wavelength wave trains with uh, 30 meter plus uh, waves on top of a higher sea level um, as we as there's geological evidence um, uh, indicating this happened um, in both Bermuda, uh, well Bahamas the, the biggest waves and then less so in Bermuda because the fetch was lower. Um, so this will cause devastating uh, coastal damage. Um, the models um, are showing these type of trends and in fact the, um, the real uh, life, the observations of ocean stratification and growing sea ice in the southern hemisphere and the uh, global warming hole off Greenland seem to indicate that in real life things are happening even faster than in the models. Um, and uh, so, you know, along with the things that we normally consider uh, with continued high fossil fuel emissions like extreme weather events, um, ocean acidification, uh, species uh, extinctions, irreplaceable loss of many species, uh, all these things um, occurring, uh, but also um, nonlinear and extremely rapid sea level rise uh, taking out coastal cities seems to be an extremely sensitive um, component of uh, uh, climate system change. So, you know, in conclusion, the two degrees Celsius global warming, so-called guardrail, two degrees warming above pre-industrial, affirmed in the Copenhagen Accord in 2009, does not provide safety to us at all. This type of warming would likely yield sea level rises of several meters um, and have uh, many other large, severely disruptive consequences such as a uh, shutdown of the southern um, meridional overturning circulation, um, slowdown or shutdown of the north of, of the uh, AMOC, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, etc. So the uh, other thing is that the global temperature change is not the best metric. Certainly the global surface, air surface temperature is, is not the best. You know, it gives a false sense of security to people, you know, thinking maybe a slowdown in the warming has occurred. You know, all that heat has gone into the, the ocean. So what is key is the, um, the energy imbalance of, of the system. So the models show about 0.8 watt per square meter, um, but the measurements are more like 0.6 watt per square meter. Um, more energy coming in than going out. So to remove this imbalance, um, Hansen and others have argued for years that CO2 needs to be reduced from 400 ppm to 350 ppm. So you know, slashing fossil uh, fuel emissions is, is vital, but we need to look at CDR, carbon dioxide removal methods, biochar, maybe seeding, uh, nutrient seeding in the southern oceans to stimulate phytoplankton growth, um, capturing more carbon in the soils, um, having massive global tree planting programs, et cetera, et cetera, before, you know, we lose, I mean, things are heading the opposite direction, like the fires, the massive fires in Alaska and uh, northern Canada and, uh, you know, also in, in, in Asia um, are rapidly reducing carbon sinks at the time we need to be increasing carbon sinks. Um, you know, a carbon fee or, or car carbon fee and dividend uh, seems to be the, the smartest way to go. Um, in, and uh, so according to Hansen, you know, we need to, if we reduced emissions 6% a year, we would reach 350 ppm by about 2100. And we have to do this. I mean, this is an extremely urgent matter. Uh, we need emergency cooperation among nations. Now, um, interestingly enough, um, you know, many people are arguing that um, 
the, this landmark paper by Hansen et al. is, is uh, you know, is painting a picture that is, that is worse than the reality. But I'm probably one of the few people that would point out that, uh, you know, in this 66-page document, there was no mention at all of increasing methane emissions. And there was no mention directly of Arctic temperature amplification and the resulting um, effect on slowing and causing waviness of the jet streams. And these are things that myself and our AMEG, Arctic Methane Emergency Group, have been talking about for a long time. That the, the, uh, the trigger of the whole thing is the extremely rapid warming of the Arctic leading to uh, loss of sea ice uh, within the next few years, um, causing greatly, uh, you know, greatly accelerated uh, release of methane from the permafrost and uh, subsea sediments, uh, for example, on the eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, which, which the Russians have been mentioned. So as, as, uh, as, as extensive and as, uh, you know, well-considered as the Hansen et al. paper is, I personally was extremely surprised that there was no indication at all, no mention of these particular things, methane, the jet stream waviness, and uh, specifically the, the Arctic temperature amplification, um, which is causing temperatures in the Arc high Arctic to be, you know, on average uh, about six times higher than the uh, global average warming temperature even higher compared to the uh, change, uh, temperature change in the equator. And also the effects on humanity of these things uh, will be uh, uh, taking out um, a large part of the uh, global food supply. Um, if there's synchronization of, of uh, crop failures um, in several parts of the world from these extreme weather events, and this will cause food price spikes and uh, spur people on to action. So um, if you've, um, so I've enjoyed doing all of these videos. Um, I love trying to look at the uh, science and trying to break it down and explain it in easily understood terms to the uh, general public. So, uh, so I'll uh, finish up here for now and thanks for your attention.